Hey, I'm Trey. Today's story is about a killer who blamed the world for a life full of misery. If you enjoy more stories such as these, I upload new content every Tuesday and Thursday. Also, please leave your comments, suggestions, or questions in the comments section because I'm always interested in your input. You help with the channel. Well, if you're ready, let's get started. Lariette Orfinelli was born 1952 in the country of Brazil. As far back as his siblings and also others could remember, they would say that he was always a troubled kid. Learte was the seventh of nine siblings. Wow! Nine siblings? That's not a family, that's a gang. You don't see that too often. No information was provided on his father, but his mother was active in raising Learte. Learte was always known to be mean-spirited to everyone. He would start fights, intentionally break other people's property, create noises, and throw things around. This was all done to get the attention of whoever he decided to target that day. Learte was treated as an outcast by everyone that knew him. His neighbors disliked him because he intentionally would create loud and obscene noises in order to disturb them often. To punish Learte for disturbing his neighbors or harming his siblings, his mother would tie his arms with strips of clothing to heavy table legs or bedposts to immobilize him. Wait a minute. She ties her own child up like a hostage? This family is completely defective. Learte would become enraged and then focus his attention on his mother. Check this out. To pay her back, he would sneak and chuck bricks at her, striking her several times. Wait a minute. So he throws bricks and hits his own mama with them. This is not a kid, this is a rabid animal. When he would attend school, he kept an evil disposition and wouldn't speak to anyone. This caused him to be isolated by all his classmates. To Laarte, attending school was synonymous with resentment, so naturally he did poorly academically. So when he finally reached the third grade, he decided to take it upon himself and drop out of school. Hold on a minute. To do what exactly? To get a job selling lemonade so he can afford to live in his treehouse? During all of this free time out of school, Learte started drinking alcohol heavily. It was at this time his mother decided to send him to a psychiatric hospital for help. A lot of these psychiatric hospitals had limited budgets so Learte, much like many others, were released from their care prematurely. Eventually, he became a frequent household name with the juvenile correctional facility for being a habitual offender. As an adult, Learte became a homeless drifter that earned a living as a shoe shiner. I guess that's about as good as it's going to get when you drop out of school in the third grade. A well-known serial killer by the name of Francisco DeMarco recently terrorized the city of Sao Paulo. This was in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Francisco was reported to have murdered and raped several small children. Francisco DeMarco had been apprehended by the authorities, but the city was still recovering from many affected families and children. For some residents, but not enough of them, became overly suspicious of anyone that perceived to be some type of threat to them and their loved ones. This was not substantiated by anything other than people's perceptions of strangers or undesirables. This would become a good policy to adopt when the community members learned of a new serial killer that's coming to a town near you. Several additional children's bodies continue to be located and citizens initially attribute them to Francisco's murder count. Autopsies have been completed on the children and it was determined that the children were recently murdered. The families of the victims also corroborated the timeline. When I say recently, I mean like they had to have happened after Francisco had been imprisoned by the authorities. A strange man one day riding a bicycle came across a couple of parents spending time with their children near their home. Two cousins, Osmarina Barbosa, who was 10 years old, and Jose Oliveira, who was 9 years old, were both playing together in front of their parents. The stranger introduced themselves to the parents and then to the small children, obviously getting their names. The stranger then began to initiate small, trivial conversations with all of them and eventually merge over to asking more specific personal questions. The specific questions weren't provided, but I'm sure they range from where they live to do they generally frequent this area or what type of ice cream and candy do the children enjoy. 
After the conversation was completed, the stranger would then bid farewell and would be last seen pedaling away on his bicycle. Over the next couple of days and weeks, that same strange man on the bicycle would be seen frequenting the area where the family lived. The stranger would then begin to speak to the children only during times when they became separated from their parents. If the people were in the area, then the stranger would make that conversation extremely brief to prevent from being actually witnessed by others interacting with the children. After a few times of discreetly meeting with the children, the bicycle stranger would offer the children candy or ice cream in order to persuade them to leave with him. If that didn't work, then the stranger would tell the children that their parents told the bicycle stranger to notify the children to follow him. The children would then be inclined to believe the stranger because the children witnessed this bicycle stranger fairly recently interacting with their parents. If any child accepted the offer with the bicycle stranger, then his or her fates would then be sealed. The children would be offered a ride on a bicycle with the stranger to an isolated location. The stranger would typically bring the children to the nearby forest or vacant house. In this particular case involving the two juvenile cousins, they were taken to an isolated sugarcane field. The stranger would commence to forcibly removing the female child's clothing, then rape the child. In the meantime, the cousin, Jose Oliveira, remained petrified with fear because the stranger threatened to kill him should he attempt to flee or intervene. After the stranger was finished with the rape of Osa Marina Barbarossa, he would then move on to the torture phase of the abduction. The stranger would improvise with his method of torture. He would take his time and either beat the child to death with sticks, stones, pipes, or bricks. Osmarina was killed by the bludgeoning and Jose was strangled to death. As a final sign of disrespect, the stranger would desecrate each one of the children's bodies by not trying to conceal the body or the items that they used to kill the child. The killer would stage the body so it would be left out in the open, naked alongside with all the other instruments that were used to murder that child. This became the killer's modus operandi. The killer would not differentiate between boys and girls in which he would bait, rape, and kill them. The children's ages ranged from 3 to 11 years old. The killer continued this murder spree over the course of 9 years. In most cases, the police were left with no clues and very little witnesses. Initially, the police didn't have enough evidence to believe that the killings were done by one person. It wasn't until 1998 when the killer attempted to abduct two children. The children were trained well on how to handle strangers, so immediately they ran and notified their parents, and the parents in turn notified the police. After this foiled abduction, the police then believed that it was possible that a serial killer could be involved with all of the murdered children. The police then re-interviewed all of the victims' families and compiled all the information that they had in order to piece together a composite sketch of the killer. The authorities reached out to the media for assistance and the sketch was disseminated throughout the city. January 2000, Lorarte or Fanelli who continued to be a homeless transient was seen by other residents at a homeless shelter nearby. He would then go to the local gas station in order to beg for money and or do odd jobs in order to earn cash. The police were immediately notified of his whereabouts and they responded and he was arrested. During the initial body search of Laarte, a notebook that turned out to be a journal was found in his possession that had the dates and locations of his whereabouts over the course of several years. Each one of those locations coincided with the murdered child. After an intense interview, Learte confessed to all the killings. Although the police were initially investigating 10 children's murders, Learte's journal exposed possibly additional homicides. The authorities did a search of several of those listed locations that were described in the journal and no children's bodies were found. Unfortunately, not enough evidence was available to convict them on any of the additional murders. Laarte was charged for 10 homicides, went to trial, and was found guilty. He was sentenced to 100 years in prison. If you enjoy more stories such as these, just click on one of the suggested videos above. I upload new content every Tuesday and Thursday. God bless and stay safe.